you know, it's amazing when you look at like pictures comparing uh, us modern humans to Neanderthals or, you know, mm -hmm. other early humans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the difference in our faces, it's like it just jumps out at you, doesn't it? Right. You see those prominent brow ridges and those like really strong jaws that kind of jut out. Mm -hmm. And it's just so obvious when you look at those fossilized faces side by side. Yeah, you can see like it's almost like a caricature of a human face. You know, it's so exaggerated. Boy. And it really highlights how much our own faces have changed over time. And the really surprising thing is the key to this difference isn't just like how much our faces grow, but it's also when they stop growing. That's right. It's all about the timing. Exactly. And this striking visual contrast, I mean, it's been something that's really captivated anthropologists for a really long time. Yeah, it's one of the big questions. What was the evolutionary path that led to our, you know, I, I guess we could say our more re refined facial structure? Right, less oh, robust. Yeah, exactly. So for today's deep dive, we are going to plunge into some really cutting edge research. Okay. That's exploring how our facial bones develop differently. Right. From our you know, extinct relatives. I'm ready. The Neanderthals and other hominins. It's about the fundamental shifts that happened as our lineage evolved. Yeah. So think of our mission as like trying to understand those crucial developmental changes, yeah. particularly those in bone growth, that explain, you know, the unique way the modern human face is built compared to Neanderthals. Right. And all these other, you know, early hominins. And scientists have been using like a really cool comparative approach to kind of unlock these secrets. Yeah, it's a fascinating way to look at it. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, it's not just about studying, you know, modern humans. Right. They're also looking at Neanderthal remains and even chimpanzee skeletons. Oh, uh -huh, okay. So you can kind of think of it as a way to investigate across these vast stretches of time, you know, millions of years to see how these different lineages you know, changed and diverged. Yeah. So we're really looking at the big picture of facial evolution here. Exactly. We're trying to see the whole sweep of how faces have evolved over time. Okay. So we're looking at human fossils. Mm -hmm. We're looking at Neanderthal remains. Yep. And we're even looking at chimpanzee skeletons. Yes. So the goal is to kind of like pinpoint yeah. those specific growth patterns that kind of differentiate each of these groups. That's right. We want to see what makes each group unique, what sets them apart in terms of how their faces develop. And one of the really central discoveries that's come from this comparative work, it's highlighted particularly in the work of Alexandra Shu at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, is that the tempo of our facial bone growth, tempo. it seems to be a really critical factor. So the pace of growth, how fast or slow, that's right. That's a key aspect to consider here. It's not just about how much the bones grow in total, but also the rate at which they grow and when that growth speeds up or slows down. So how does bringing chimpanzees into this analysis help us understand things better? Well, chimpanzees, they share a common ancestor with both humans and Neanderthals okay. way back in our evolutionary family tree, right? Egg. So by comparing you know, chimpanzee facial development to ours and Neanderthals, researchers can kind of identify which traits are like really old, yeah. you know, deeply rooted in our shared heritage Okay. versus, you know, the traits that are more recent. Yeah, gotcha. So it helps us build like a more complete timeline of how certain facial features evolve. So it gives us that context. Yeah, it gives us that deep evolutionary history. Okay. So we can see how faces changed over millions of years. That makes perfect sense. Oh. Okay, so what is the main difference in how our faces develop compared to Neanderthals and chimps? Okay, so one of the biggest differences is that human faces, they actually stop expanding earlier in life. They just stop growing sooner. Compared to Neanderthals and a lot of other, like, large-faced primates. So it sounds almost too simple, but I suppose that shorter period of growth could really lead to, like, a noticeably different adult face. Yeah. It's almost, you know, if you think about it, like two construction projects, right? Yeah. You have one where the gunters are working really intensely for a long time. Yeah. And they end up with this big, you know, structure. Right. And that's kind of like the Neanderthal face. Okay. But then you have another project where the builders are working just as intensely, but they finish much earlier. Okay. And they end up with a smaller building. Right. And that's our faces. Exactly. So less time dedicated to bone growth equals smaller adult facial structure. That's right. And this is really clear when we look at the fossil record. Yeah. You see those robust faces of our ancestors, like Neanderthal faces. Mm. They show signs of continued growth over a longer period. 
So that explains those like more prominent jaws and broader mid faces that we see in a lot of these archaeological finds. That's great. So their faces were still like actively developing. Yeah. While ours had pretty much reached their adult dimensions. Right. So we stopped early. Exactly. They yeah. kept going. And this difference in timing may have actually been beneficial for humans. Oh, really? How so? Well, some researchers like Shu. They've suggested that stopping growth earlier might have helped us conserve energy. Oh, interesting. You know, we didn't need to spend as much energy growing and maintaining those big, heavy facial bones. So it's kind of like being more efficient with our resources. Exactly. Right. We could focus our energy on other things. Got it. And Shu specifically pointed out that this change in development during the later stages of growth, you know, like around adolescence, yeah. that's what leads to our smaller faces. Oh, okay. Because our facial growth tends to slow down a lot around that time. Okay. And it stops pretty soon after. Okay, so it's not just the total amount of growth. Right. But it's also about when that growth happens and when it ends. Exactly. It's all about the timing. All right, so let's kind of dig a little deeper into how that timing is actually controlled at the level of the bone itself. Okay. Are there, like, differences in how that bone tissue actually changes over time? Absolutely. So there are shifts in what we call bone activity. Bone activity. These are the processes of bone deposition. Okay. Which is where new bone tissue is formed and bone resorption where older tissue is broken down. Got it. So these processes really guide that reduced growth that we see in humans. Okay. And if these activities slow down earlier, right. as they do in humans, the maxilla, that's the upper jaw. Upper jaw. Okay. It doesn't project as far forward. Okay. And that results in a more compact face. Gotcha. Like, you know, less prominent. Right. Compared to Neanderthals. So it's almost like our bone remodeling crew kind of winds down their work on our faces earlier compared to our ancestors. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. So they're like, okay. Time to pack up. We're done here. Right. Move on to something else. Whereas in these larger face species, those activities continue on. Okay. Much more intensely. Got it. And for a longer duration. So they're just plugging away. They're still working. Yeah. Okay. So that leads to, you know, thicker, yeah. more prominent features. Right. Exactly. And when you think about like those really huge ancient skulls we sometimes find, oh, it... this ongoing bone growth really highlights just how critical timing is right for that overall facial appearance it's not just about how much bone you lay down it's about when you lay it down it's about when you stop and when you stop yeah so it's almost like our faces hit the pause button on major growth mm -hmm. earlier in that developmental timeline yeah exactly okay so even though you know we have a relatively long childhood our faces aren't necessarily continuing to grow at the same rate during those later years. No, they're not. Okay. That's a key point. Okay. So, you know, some facial features might be established pretty early on, mm -hmm. but the major differences between species, right. those really come out in those last few years leading up to adulthood. Yeah. Like how big the face is overall, how much it projects forward. Right, those final touches. That's when you really see those distinctions. Yeah. And Shu and her team, they've shown that identifying these key developmental changes it's essential for understanding how these, you know, species specific traits emerged. Okay, so this all leads to the big why question, doesn't it? Right. Like what could have been the driving force behind this shift in our facial growth patterns? That's the million dollar question. Were there any like environmental pressures at play? Well, there are several ideas out there. Okay. But it's important to remember that we're probably not looking at like one simple explanation. Right, it's complex. It's probably a bunch of factors working together. Yeah. But one idea is that, you know, changes in how we process food, like cooking. Okay, so like softer foods. Yeah. Exactly. Less work for the jaw. Yeah, so maybe that reduced the demands on our jaws. And over time, you know, maybe that led to selection for less robust facial structures. Okay. But, you know, most scientists think that's probably not the whole story. Right. Because, you know, even with softer foods, we still need to chew. We still got to use those muscles. Exactly. So there are other hypotheses that suggest that, you know, maybe social and behavioral factors played a role. Okay. You know, maybe there were these subtle selective pressures over long periods that kind of influenced facial growth. Gotcha. But when we look at the biological evidence, you know, like our genes and how our bones actually grow, Mm -hmm. It really points to those genetic mechanisms that control bone growth okay. as a major driver. All right. So it could be largely determined by our genes, 
when our faces kind of decide, okay, we're done with the major growth phase. Yeah, that seems to be a big part of it. Okay. You know, and hormones, particularly during adolescence, they probably play a role too. Yeah. But again, most scientists think it's this combo of our genes, our environment, and maybe even our habits. Right. That makes sense. It's complex. It's complicated. Evolution is never like a straight line. No, it's messy. There's always twists and turns. It's a winding road. So where is this research headed in the future? What are scientists hoping to discover next? Well, now that we have these, you know, basic findings, mm -hmm. researchers are really keen to look at a wider range of fossils. Okay. You know, from different periods in human history. So expanding the data set. Exactly. They want to see if other ancient human groups, not just Neanderthals, yeah. showed similar patterns. Got it. You know, did they also stop growing earlier? So kind of like mapping this pattern across our broader evolutionary family. Exactly. We want to see if it's something that's unique to our lineage, you know, our direct ancestors, yeah. or if it popped up in other branches of the family tree as well. Gotcha. And they also want to look at variation in growth rates across different regions. You know, were there adaptations that were specific to certain environments or survival challenges? Yeah, okay. So by charting these variations, the goal is to figure out, you know, which traits are universal to modern humans. Okay. And which ones might be unique adaptations to particular environments. So it's almost like trying to reconstruct a really intricate evolutionary history. Yeah, it's like a giant puzzle. Piece by piece. We're putting the pieces together to try and see the whole picture. Yeah. And this research really acts as a bridge Okay. between biology and culture and our history. Right. And it helps us understand the factors that shaped our, you know, defining features. Yeah, the things that make us look the way we do. Right. And I've heard there are even like emerging clues. There are. About the potential links between like facial evolution and social evolution. Yeah, it's a fascinating area. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, the idea is that facial expressions and our ability to recognize them, mm -hmm. those are really important for how we interact, how communities function. Okay. And maybe a smaller face, a more mobile face, right. okay. maybe that offered some advantages in these areas. Okay. But to really know for sure, we need to dig deeper into prehistoric behavior and the ecological pressures of the time. Right. We need more evidence. Exactly. Okay. So let's bring it all together. Okay. What's the key message here for understanding, you know, why we look so different from our ancient relatives? The key message is that the timing of our facial growth. Timing. That is a crucial factor in understanding these differences. Okay. The fact that our faces stop growing earlier yeah. than Neanderthals and other large-faced hominins, right. that leads to the smaller, less projecting face that we see as like distinctly human. Yeah, our signature look. Right. Okay. And this shift in the developmental timeline may have actually opened up new possibilities for us. Okay. You know, new ways to adapt. Interesting. While still meeting our basic developmental needs. So it really emphasizes that it's not just the final shape of our faces, right? but it's also the duration and the speed of those developmental processes that got us there. Right. It's about the journey, not just the destination. Exactly. It's really amazing to think that something as fundamental as, you know, when our bones decide to stop growing. It is. Has played such a huge role in our evolutionary journey. It really gives you a fresh perspective on what makes us us. Absolutely. Yeah. It makes you wonder, you know, could these subtle shifts in the timing of growth have had other effects? Yeah. Maybe some unexpected consequences for other parts of our development or even our behavior. That is a very thought provoking question to end on. Yeah. So what do you think about this fascinating aspect of our facial evolution? Share your thoughts and insights in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into human origins, be sure to subscribe for more explorations into the science that shapes us.